Uh, a few years back, I had the opportunity to travel to India. And I went uh, last week, if you were uh, participating in our worship, Dr. Sam Thomas was with us. And Philip and I, who you see on the screen, this is a few years back. Yes, uh, no beard on the face. And uh, um, Philip and I, we went to India. There is a picture of us in the Taj Mahal. If you don't know Philip, he's on our staff right now working as my executive assistant. But we're looking forward to opportunities for him to step into uh, different roles even in the future. Uh, but Philip and I, we were, we were going and we were speaking at their pastor's conference over there. It was a wonderful time. But let me just say, uh, this trip was quite eventful. I guess there's many stories that I could say about this trip, but, but one of them in particular. So we were in Rajasthan in Kota, India, and we were supposed to take an overnight train ride from there back to New Delhi to catch our flight. And uh, if, you've, if you've never ridden a train overnight in India, let's just say you haven't traveled. Uh, it was filled with gypsies. I'm convinced there were lice in our cabin. It was, it was uh, quite a traumatic experience. We did, have, we did have a sleeper cabin. And so we walked into the cabin and we're like, okay, it, there were four beds, two bunk beds. And we walked in and we were like, okay, at least it's just us. And so we tried to settle in. I think we had, I don't even remember all the details. I'm convinced we walked past live animals to get into our little bunk cabin. And so we get in there, we're kind of trying to settle, settle down, felt a little creepy, uh, but we're, you know, we're dead tired on major jet lag still. And we, we kind of settle into our bunks and we're, you know, it's, it's when your senses are heightened and every little sound, you know, I'm, I'm elaborating, but I'm sure there were like cockroaches in the corner playing the violin. I mean, it was that creepy. And so um, anyway, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden the door opens up. And two other men walk in, um, Indian men, not able to speak our language. And then it really got awkward and uncomfortable. Needless to say, we didn't sleep the rest of the night because there were these two strangers now in our private cabin. Um, they're fast asleep. Philip and I are trying to make sure we don't die. Needless to say, um, it was quite an eventful trip. Now, now you've made, maybe you've been on a trip like this one. Perhaps not, but I'm sure you can at least relate to some journey that you've been on that didn't quite go as you expected it to. For Paul, we've been, we've been following with him for several chapters now on this journey where he has moved through Asia in an effort to get back, finally reaching his destination in Rome. And we know that he's had one roadblock or one setback after another. I mean, he's endured mob scenes and riots and attempted assassinations and shipwrecks and snake bites. Uh, maybe, maybe he had such a great attitude he laughed it off. Um, but I am sure there's evidence in Scripture to show that along the way he was discouraged uh, and he needed to find encouragement from other people. So now his journey is finally reaching a conclusion. He's finally, we're going to see today, he's going to make his way toward Rome. And I think there are some lessons that you and I can learn that are very applicable to our lives this morning as we're going to drive and drill down into verses 11 through 16 of Acts chapter 28. So if you're taking notes, which I strongly encourage you to do. Here's the first point of the day. We're going to notice light in the darkness. Let's read verse 11, and I'd love just to make a few observations. After three months, time out, remember, we're just picking up in this ongoing story, three months that they had been on this island of Malta. You can go back and rewatch the sermon from last week or listen to that to kind of catch up. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Okay, we know what's happening in the story because we've studied the previous verses, but for now, for some reason, the Holy Spirit uh, led Luke to include this interesting fact about twin brothers having a figurehead on this ship. Now, what, who were they and why does it matter? Uh, this, this is referring to Zeus, two sons of Zeus, Castor and Pollux. And, and they were, they were uh, 
in the mythological beliefs of that day within Rome, they were kind of the patrons of sailors on ships. And they believed that Poseidon had given them power over the wind and the waves. And, and their special constellation up in the sky was Gemini that they were used to navigate. And all of this was kind of woven into the ideology of mariners at that time. And so there was a carving of them on the bow of the ship. Martin Luther, in my study over this passage, I read where he reflected on this verse uh, uh, that Paul willingly sat in this ship on which two gods were painted or carved, and he went on board. He, he didn't bother about them at all. He didn't tear them down. He didn't refuse to enter because this was a ship that had been clearly dedicated to pagan gods. And so without a doubt, he wanted to show that outward things uh, maybe don't damage our faith as much as we may think if only the heart does not cleave to them or puts their trust in them. Those were kind of the comments of Martin Luther. But the words must first capture the people's hearts and then open their eyes. The words of truth of the gospel of Scripture. So why is it important for this text to, to point out that false gods were here on this ship when we don't even have that problem in America, do we? Well, I, I could talk to you about shops in this town or in this country where idols are on display or maybe even for sale. Furthermore, uh, listen carefully, this may be a reminder of evil, some idols that are in your home. And I'm not specifically talking about some, some bronze idol of another god that you may have on display in your home. What I want us to help us understand is this. Idolatry can easily creep into our life. Uh, when you take a good thing and turn it into a God thing, it becomes a bad thing. So your phone may be an idol. Your, your investment portfolio may be an idol. Your hobby can even become an idol. And I was reading or scrolling rather through social media the other day, which I'm sure all of us are doing entirely too much right now. But I, I saw this comment that someone had posted relating to this current pandemic. And they said that one advantage that, that, it, that God has allowed for the removal of many idols in our life, the idolatry of sports, been removed, entertainment, wealth, maybe even work for this moment has been removed. And if you and I can look at this with a, a different lens, perhaps we can see this is an opportunity for us to repent of some of this idolatry in our life and choose to seek the Lord first. Church, I, I realize this is a, maybe a hard truth to receive, but it is an important one to live out. Uh, let me turn your attention, if I may, to Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, and it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And the truth is, church, all we need is Christ. And we are commanded to live out that message. We're challenged to share that message while we're called to carry hope to the world. So this means then I've got to resist the temptation of idolatry in my life. We see it around us. We, we experience it in our own lives if we're being honest. And when we see the world living with these tendencies, it, it becomes maybe even more difficult for us not to be swept in. Because you and I are called to carry hope. We're urged to have gospel conversations. And the gospel will impact culture. But we also need to understand that culture can impact our understanding of the gospel as well. So here we see in verse 11, Paul is clearly walking through and even using a, a pagan culture dedicated ship to help him continue his mission. And it kind of draws our idea to this thought today. I think it reminds us that we have a choice to make regarding culture. I want to I present to you three possible approaches or choices that you can make in engaging culture around you today. And I'll even go so far as to recommend which one I would suggest is most wise most of the time. The first one is this. You could choose to immerse yourself in culture. Uh, this is the idea that would say, well, hey, everybody else is doing it, so why should I? And, and I think you need to be guarded because this whatever attitude will likely lead you toward addictions in private that will impact you in public. 
Uh, this immersive kind of whatever attitude, uh, when taken to the extreme, this, um, this approach, it's going to embrace those gray areas of life. And what we need to understand as Christians, when, when Christians embrace those gray areas, the better way of life that we are called to offer can even be perceived as a gray area too. But that is an option. I can choose to just lay aside any filter and immerse whatever culture brings my way and dive in fully. Uh, another option, I could choose to retreat from culture. This would be the, the boycott mentality. This would be the, hey, I don't like what's on TV, so I'm going to throw the whole television out of the room. Uh, this, this attitude tends to lead toward a, a knee-jerk reaction. It's kind of like uh, as a kid, for example, I may have had some cassette tapes. Yes, I know kids, uh, you may be listening to this and not know what that means. Ask your parent. Uh, but the retreat mentality of culture would say, I'm just going to take these cassette tapes and burn them. Um, this, to the extreme, this may look like uh, someone moving to a monastery just to completely isolate themselves, fully retreating from culture. And I would say uh, there, there are times when even Christ modeled isolating himself for a season. I think sometimes this is healthy. I would even encourage you during this current climate that we're living in, that's a possible attitude that you could take of choosing for a season, a day, a week, whatever. There is benefit in healthy isolation to kind of recalibrate our mind in an appropriate way. But this retreat idea from culture all the time I would say is not necessarily the best choice. In fact, I would encourage you to consider uh, the third approach or mindset toward culture would be one to engage. Engaging culture means I'm aware of culture. I'm aware of what's going on around me. I'm, I'm aware of how others around me think or the ideology of the day. I'm aware of it. But I'm also going to choose to live within guardrails that are biblical that I've set in place. In other words, uh, this approach toward culture would say, I'm going to invite accountability into my life for online use. And I'm going to set reasonable limits on my behavior. Uh, we, we know this. 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us that we are Christ's ambassador. Think about what an ambassador is. It's someone who is not from a country that chooses to live and fully understand the country where they are commissioned to be an ambassador so that they can represent one country within the culture of another. 2 Corinthians 5.20 illustrates that's who we are. We are Christ's ambassadors. So as we live in the world, we should understand it. We should know it. Uh, but we're representing another world. We are representing the kingdom of God while we live in the midst of this world. But I would say if we choose to engage culture, we should do so within the lens of Scripture. So understanding this principle should lead us to a couple of things. One, that I am called to be in the world, but not of it. Uh, let me read John 17, 14 through 19 and make a few comments. Uh, God's Word says this, I have given them your word... And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. And my ability to be in the world but not of the world is a part of me uh, sanctifying myself through Scripture. I'm using the word of truth as my filter on how I should view the world, how I should interact with the world, and how I should engage culture. If you're a business person, this impacts your integrity in the boardroom. If you're a single adult, this impacts your dating life because you understand that dating is not a, an evangelism tactic. Uh, a concentrated and sanctified life will cause you to live within boundaries and guardrails that you have set in place that are based upon Scripture. Meaning this, uh, uh, this is practically what it could look like. If, if I'm listening to music on Spotify and I play a song that promotes sin, I can just change the channel, but it doesn't need to have to throw away my phone. In the world, but not of it. Here's the second idea. Being a light in 
the darkness. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16 tells us, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. For us, We say this often here at Calvary. In our mission to carry hope to the world every day, this will invite you and I to become cultural missionaries. Since I am an ambassador of God to this world, I need to understand the world in which I live. And I need to be committed as part of it to carry hope. So uh, what I decided we would do this morning to better understand this, I've invited a member of our church to come up onto the stage. Come on up here. We're going to make sure we do this right. In fact, here we go. We're going to practice social distancing here. Make sure we're sure. okay. We're good. We're six feel feet apart. I feel safe. Uh, <laughs> I, I Tell us your name, for those of you who don't know you. Tell us your name, how long you've been a part of Calvary, and uh, how long you've been following Jesus. Absolutely. Thank you, Ricky, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Brian Taylor. Uh, I've been attending Calvary for about 18 years. My kids go to school here, uh, and then I've been following the Lord for about 20, 21 years. Okay. Brian, I've asked you to come today to just to kind of give an example of what it looks like to, to live in the world in which we live, but to carry hope in that commitment. So tell us for understanding and context, uh, what company do you work for and what do you guys do? Absolutely. Listen to your message, you're teeing me up for this thing. So uh, yeah, I have the privilege of being the general manager of Southeast Restoration. So we are a full service insurance restoration company. Okay, so you're in basically in kind of a a construction type general contract, bridging with people in, in crisis, and your company's even helped my family uh, in crisis. Now, the, the intent and purpose, with full disclosure, is, is not to promote your business, but just to use it as an example today. So as Brian talks, I want you to contextualize and filter through what we're talking about as it fits into your world. So uh, let's talk about Southeast for a minute. Uh, how does the culture of your company even um, promote or encourage you carrying hope and and being a light to the to the darkness absolutely Uh, so i'd mentioned you know we're licensed general contractors so we are we specialize in insurance restoration so we have the privilege of partnering alongside homeowners and business owners in crisis so i tell my team often we are unwelcome guests i mean nobody wants to call southeast restoration if they're calling southeast something has just happened Uh, their life has been interrupted um, so we have the privilege of coming alongside of those uh, businesses and homeowners to partner with them and to restore their lives. Our, our uh, purpose statement is restoring lives, repairing property. Uh, our core is one of our core values is C323, which is Colossians 323. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. It's working for the Lord, not for man. Serve with compassion. Uh, so that uniquely positions us to meet people in really one of their most vulnerable you know, times of their life. Uh, Brian, thanks for that, because I think it's helpful to understand uh, maybe you're listening to this and you are an entrepreneur, you run a small business, that you can even weave into the culture of your company a commitment to uh, be a light and, and to express the hope of Christ uh, through biblical principles. But not everybody works for a Christian company, and God has called us to impact the culture as an ambassador wherever we are. You're obviously in general contracting, which stereotypically would be a pretty hard a group of people that you may work with as subcontractors or whatever. So uh, share specifically so that anybody could apply. uh, What does it look like for you and your commitment to be a light and carry hope? Absolutely. Uh, So I've been with the company for 15. So originally when I came on, I was a project manager. So I mean, I'm meeting, I'm on the front lines. I'm meeting with the homeowners. I'm holding their hands. I'm looking for opportunities to pray, to speak life into that situation. Because I mean, their life has just been turned upside down. Um, as of about 10 years ago, I mean, I've been blessed again to be their general manager. So what that looks like for me now is my main concern is making sure my faith is strong to where I can go into my company and to communicate that message to the team. Um, and ultimately that is my team. That's my group of people that I'm serving on a day-to-day basis. So I'm serving them. I'm praying with them. I'm looking for opportunities to kind of speak life into them so they can go out into the Chattahoochee Valley and live out that mission. I mean, I say that this is our, our mission field. So again, we, 
we deal with the public, but we deal with the public in their world, across their threshold. So we see a, a side of their life that they don't really see in public. So that gives us opportunities, again, to, to pray with them. And if, it's, if that's not their thing, at least to see there's something different about this group of people, that they're taking their time, they're loving, they're listening. Um, and ultimately, we want to restore their lives and repair their property. That's great, Brian. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate you coming today and giving a little bit of your time. You. As you've been listening to Brian and you've been kind of applying that to your situation, I hope what you hear is whether you're on the front line or maybe you're in a multiplier role, even in your occupation every day, there is an opportunity for you in how you care, how you love, and how you communicate to show them that you're different, but also allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal those opportunities for you when you can explicitly express hope carrying the name of Jesus, bringing the name of Jesus up, even going so far if the opportunity lends itself to pray with Him. Because here's what I need you to understand. We live in a culture that's changing every single day. And it is our mission to carry a never-changing gospel to an ever-changing world. That's our mission. The gospel never changes, even when culture seems to be rapidly changing. It even seems to be accelerated in this current context that we're living through this COVID-19 epidemic. But we have a never-changing gospel being bannered by a never-changing God that we can broadcast to an ever-changing world. In fact, if we've talked about this before. If you compare uh, Peter's response in Acts chapter 2 to Paul's response in Acts chapter 17, we see the difference even through Scripture of what it looks like to broadcast the gospel to a group of people in Acts 2 that had a presupposition of understanding God versus an Acts 17, which is completely pagan. And I would suggest that you and I may have grown up in an Acts 2 America, but we are now carrying hope to an Acts 17 America. Here's the second point of the day. Lightening your load. We see Paul having an opportunity to lighten his load in verses 12 through 15. Read along with me if you would. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. That is kind of the path they took by sea. And after one day a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Patoli. And there we found brothers, and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. And on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage." See, here we get a description of how Paul transitions in his route from moving from sea, traveling by foot inland. And, and there's, there's two places that are, are, are kind of highlighted here, the form of Appius and the three traverns. And, and on this main route from the port into Rome, uh, these two cities, one was, uh, or, or places were about 43 miles from Rome and the other about 33 miles from Rome on the same road. And here's what this suggests. And why I recommend that it's important. It suggests to us today that there are two separate groups of brothers that came to meet Paul in his route from Rome. The beauty of it is, is this is showing us the body of Christ that's already at work and active in and around Rome. Uh, Luke literally tells us here as the writer of Acts that they had heard about his affairs, meaning they had probably heard through some, maybe it was a tradesman that was traveling. They had heard about what was happening to Paul in their arrival and their projected journey to Rome. And Paul, uh, three years earlier, he had written the letter that we now call Romans to the church at Rome, telling them about his longing to visit them and his desire to gain their support for another stage of his missionary outreach. In fact, uh, most scholars, as I was reading through this, suggest that, that these two groups of believers probably represent two separate house churches that came together representing two different congregations that rushed to meet Paul. And in fact, Christians in Rome are, are really not mentioned a whole lot. We see them mentioned here in Acts. We see them mentioned in Acts chapter 2, where some of the Christians from Rome were present at Pentecost. But their presence here is significant, and they serve as a constant encouragement for him. Uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 12, uh, 
the desire that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And I don't think it's coincidence that just at the right time, these other brothers came and met with Paul, intersected him on his journey. And the encouragement for Paul is that the gospel was present in Rome prior to Paul ever getting there. How encouraging. Imagine three years earlier, he had written this letter encouraging them. Now for the first time, he gets to experience some of the fruit of this labor. This is a reminder for us that that God is at work even when you can't see it. This is extremely helpful for us as parents or, or those who may minister to students or teenagers that often we may invest time and we may invest in discipleship principles, but it may take years for us to see any evidence of that. This is also a reminder for us that, that Jesus has gone before Paul and the hope that he has gone before us in every situation at just the right time when he needed encouragement, God sends other believers to him. Uh, let, me, let me remind us of truth from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 that says, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. And here, a thousand miles from his homeland, he was not among strangers. He he was surrounded by those who had never actually seen his face, but who loved him fervently in Christ. There in this land of idolatry, of, of heathen temples and every form of wickedness and corruption, He finds himself encouraged in the presence of other believers who loved the name of Jesus and adored him, and they'd never even met him face to face. And it's as if if he's walking in this dark land, and their presence and encouragement was a light of hope to him. Love and joy were received. Uh, I think this begs us to ask a question. How has biblical community brought you refreshment. Maybe it was in a time of trial. Maybe it was in everyday life group encounters. For example, uh, consider how a life group, which by the way, if you're not plugged into one, you really should be. And uh, even though we're scattered right now, there are still ways digitally for you to connect with your life group or join into a life group. But consider how a life group can come around you when you're hurting. Or, Or maybe it's through a shared expression of joy. Maybe you, you've had a child and they come along to celebrate with you. Or in a time of trial where maybe you've lost your job and that life group can come alongside to encourage you and help support you. Because we see in verse 15, the words are that Paul took courage. See, this implies if he took courage, it infers that he was discouraged. And, and we see repeatedly through Paul's journey, there were moments where he was down, where he was discouraged. It, and maybe he even was prone to have this emotion. In fact, Jesus appeared to him personally a few times just to encourage him. And I think, I think this is really important for us to lean into and press in for just a moment. Because there are many of us, Uh, Many of you that are watching this, that you struggle with ongoing discouragement. Maybe even even you use words like seasonal depression or or whatever that anxiety feeling may be for you, where you just feel defeated. Uh, Here's some interesting stats when I was researching this. Uh, 80% of mothers experience postpartum depression. 5% of the U.S. population experience seasonal depression. Over 18% of Americans struggle with anxious thought discouragement and defeat, folks, it can, it can spiral into depression and into isolation. And I want you to know this morning, this is a common tactic of the enemy. And you and I, especially right now more than ever, where we're forced to be socially distant, I hate that phrase, by the way, there's going to be a, even more of a strong tendency for us to allow these anxious thoughts or isolation or depression or discouragement to creep in and be very aware of it right now, that the enemy would love to use this in your heart right now. Uh, so to combat this, I want to encourage you with what does the Bible say about discouragement? I'm not going to read these verses to you, but I invite you just to write the references down and you can read them later. 
John 1, 9, it's where we're encouraged to be strong and courageous. Why? Because the Lord will be with you wherever you go. In Deuteronomy 31, 8, we're reminded that the Lord himself goes before you. Folks, he's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. John 16, 33 is when Jesus even says, hey, in me, you will have peace. Jesus is a conqueror. Romans 15, 13. We're challenged when Paul writes, for the God of hope to fill you with peace. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety or your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Isaiah 41, 10, do not fear. I am with you. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Psalm 42, 5. Speaking to my soul, why am I so defeated? Why am I so downcast? We, we read of the lament of the writer of Psalm. But put your hope in God and praise Him. He is your Savior. Don't believe the lies about you. Don't believe the lies of the enemy, even in your situation. Instead, choose to believe the truth about who God is. And when you feel down and when you feel defeated, choose to lighten your load. See, Paul found encouragement from the Word. He found encouragement from Christ. He finds encouragement in other believers. Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2 tells us, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Here in this verse, it's, it's even encouraging us, even helping each other struggle through sin. Lift one and each other up. Do it with gentleness. Do it with love. Do it with respect. We see the example here in Acts chapter 28 of the brothers coming along just to encourage Paul on this long journey where he was feeling defeated. And regardless of what spectrum that you may be wrestling with this overwhelming sense of, of downheartedness and depression and defeat and anxiety and worry, here's what you need to hear. You are not alone. You're not alone, church. Choose to stand with Christ. Choose to lean on His people. Choose to allow yourself to be leaned on. This is a moment and a season in our life where it's never been more important for you to love your neighbor as yourself. The, the importance of life groups right now, more than ever, they matter the most. That intentional effort to, to reach out, to contact, to care, to do it proactively, to not just do it once, but to do it daily or weekly or repeatedly. Love on each other. Put yourself out there and make yourself available to serve your neighbor as yourself. The third point of the day, and I must go quickly. Looks like we made it. I, I can't, every, I don't know why I even made this the point, because every time I say it, I, Barry Manilow tune comes into my head. Anyway, uh, let's read verse 16. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. He finally made it. He finally makes it to Rome. After, after years of travel, he finally reached this destination where his heart had desired to reach so many years before. Uh, have you ever gone on a trip and you finally got there and just the joy in your heart? Uh, it reminds me of, uh, of a few road trips up. Full confession, my family, we're Disney people. And so it's kind of like every time we're driving down the road and we pass through the gates of Disney World, it's like, well, looks like we made it. I mean, there's so much joy because, you know, we're tired of being in the car and we're, we're tired of, of just the, 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 the pain of the travel. And here there's so much, immediately the pain goes away when we see these gates. It's like, looks like we finally made it. Now, Paul's journey and mission to Rome pales uh, is so much more exponentially important than a vacation to Disney World. I simply say that to help us maybe find some level of connection to the emotion that he must have felt when he finally reached this destination. Certainly, it, it didn't go according to plan. But what we do know is that this trip was Paul's desire. We read this all the way back in Acts chapter 19, verse 21. And we know that this journey was specifically commissioned by Jesus himself. We read of that in Acts chapter 23, 11. 
And there is beauty in Paul's plans being in line with God's commission. There is beauty in my life and in yours when my plans are in line with God's commission. And, and Paul, even in this, even in this imprisonment, he was given so much more than rest. His, his circumstances were unique. He was, he was favored and honored and allowed to, to live in a private house with only one guard who was with him. Yes, he was still in chains. He was still confined, but he wasn't with others in a public prison. And in the, in the providence of God, he was even enabled while in prison in Rome to continue, continue his mission, continue to meet with people who had access to come and listen and to learn and be fed and be encouraged. So even in his imprisonment, he was still able to mobilize the church in Rome. Paul was given this unique freedom. And I believe it is affirming because his desire was in line with the mission of God. And similarly to Paul, you and I are bound to the call of Christ that our desires are in line with his commission for our life, no matter what the circumstances may be. And practically, you may say, okay, how, what does this look like? How do I get there? I would say this looks like a daily attitude of submission, even in your prayer life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul says, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. I urge you, church, evaluate your prayer life and to submit to Christ daily uh, with transparency. I, man, my, my prayer life, the Lord is working to develop that. But just as an example, this is not me elevating myself, just simply giving you an example. Every morning in my prayer life, this is... Uh, from my lips to the heart of God. God, I acknowledge that you are the creator and the sustainer of the world. You are sovereign and in control of all things, and you have the authority over all. And today, you have authority over me. It is a daily reminder. This is not me uh, getting saved every day. This is an active pursuit of the Lord walking in daily submission, that I make sure from my lips, I say that every day in acknowledgement, God, today I submit to your authority. And it even causes us then to evaluate our decision-making process. Because if I say that he's in charge of my life, but I never ask him to influence my decision, is he really in charge? If you say that he is in charge, but you never seek his will, is he really in charge? Uh, I encourage you to resist the desire to, to feed your ego and to think that you have arrived through all of this. Because here is today's sermon in one single sentence. You only really make it when you follow Jesus. No matter how hard your journey may feel, no matter what circumstances may have been around you, no matter the trial, the pain, the torment, the discouragement, the encouragement, the celebrations, or the defeat that you may have navigated through your journey, if you try to do it without Jesus, you're destined for failure. You only really make it when you follow him, when your desires are in line with his commission. And a life with Jesus, a life that's surrendered to Jesus, is one that is filled with peace and filled with purpose, even when you're in pain. Church, there's so much to learn from Paul's example we see him in this journey. Yes, he's, he's finally reached his destination, but it was, a, it was a journey that was filled with pain. And you may be pursuing the Lord with all of your might and with all integrity, but right now you are consumed with pain. I, I've been talking to you. I know that many of you have lost your jobs this week, or you've had to take a cut in pay this week, or you're staring down the road of what may come next week or next month. I understand the anxiety and the fear, but I just need you to understand that the Lord has gone before you. And in Him and through Him, it is by Him that we live and move and have our being. And you can trust Him. No matter the circumstance, you can lean in on Him and trust Him. And we are called as brothers and sisters in Christ to lean in on one another and to allow yourself to be leaned upon as we bear one another's burdens. So what do we do with all this? I realize that there's so much that has been covered through just these short verses here in Acts chapter 28 today. 
So many insights that, that the Holy Spirit perhaps has, there's been a repeating thing where the Lord has pressed upon your heart today and prompted you in how you should respond. That response in our language of church is called a next step. And we believe that when God's word is presented, it demands a response. So what is your next step today? What will you put into practice today and moving forward throughout this week different? Uh, I will present three possible next steps to you today. The first one is this. Perhaps you say, today, I put my trust in Jesus and make him the king of my life. Perhaps today you've been trying to do this on your own and you've never trusted your life with Jesus. You've never, you've never really accepted that life that he has for you filled with peace and purpose and you can't get there on your own. Believing that God sent his son Jesus to die for you. He, he created you for a relationship to begin all the way back in the Garden of Eden, but sin has been that trap that separates from God. But God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross from you. He died. He rose from the grave. He now is ascended and seated next to the Father, interceding on your behalf. And your trust in him today can move you from death to life. My, my goodness is not enough. I can't, I can't earn enough. I can't serve enough. I can't give enough. I can't love enough. And in fact, my righteousness is filth. I deserve the wrath of God. I deserve separation in a real hell. But because of God's love for us, that he sent his son Jesus to die for us, we can read and understand the truth of Romans, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved in putting your trust in him and making him the king of your life, change your world forever. So if that's the desire of your heart, right there where you are in the quietness of your home, have that conversation with God using your own words to acknowledge your sin, recognizing God's desire to have a relationship with you and put your trust in Jesus in the only way that you can be made right with God. Perhaps you're here today and you have put your trust in Jesus, but you need to be reminded as a next step that daily in your pursuit of him, that you will submit to the authority of King Jesus. And I would remind you or encourage you as a daily practice, even saying those words of acknowledging his authority over your life and over your circumstances and over your heart is a beautiful place of peace. And I encourage you weekly that you will choose to live life in community with a life group. And if you need help connecting with us, call or contact the church office, whether that's phone, email, social media. We would love to help you get connected with a life group. Our life group leaders and those that have been working hard and diligently this week, most everyone should have gotten contacted this week. And we want to continue doing that because we want you to know, we want you to be connected with other people. While we're so prone to be isolated, you're not alone. And that is a weekly commitment that you can have to live in biblical community with others.